Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless first timothy 4:16. pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching persevere in these things for as you do this you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you first corinthians 6 9 through 11 or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5, 11, and 12 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak for those things which are done by them in secret. It's Faith Friday, and it's a special one as we celebrate Pride Month. Our next guest is committed to including the LGBTQ plus community at church. He most certainly is, and here to share a message of hope is the Vice President of the Metropolitan New York Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Please welcome Christopher Vergara. Good to see you, man. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. So it is Pride Month. Let's talk about why it's important for inclusivity when it comes to churches. I feel like a lot of churches now are moving toward acceptance. Mm -hmm. I think inclusivity is important because I think diversity is a gift that we get. It's not a mandate. It's not something to check off a list. It's something important to the work that we do um, as communities of faith. Um, the Lutheran churches of New York are committed to doing um, this work of gender uh, justice, racial justice, um, economic justice, immigrant justice, and all that work, I think it's only helped by having the individual lived experience of as many people as possible contributing to that work. Um, I think we as queer people, I think there's this notion, recent notion that we just sort of our recent invention that we've just sort of come out of nowhere and we are a but a, that comes from being shunned <laughs> in yeah. the past at all these churches right but we are a proud and ancient people who've survived centuries of persecution and we're still here and even now as our communities as our spaces our relationships even our bodies are under threat we continue to survive and thrive and that level of resiliency I think is an asset to anybody who's trying to do any kind of work and justice in our communities Colossians 2.8 Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. When you take a step back and you think about this, for so many LGBT, LGBTQ plus people, mm -hmm. the, the struggle between church mm -hmm. and, and their sexuality is something that you hear from people over and over and mm -hmm. over again because they don't find that acceptance right. at church. So what would you say for someone who's struggling with that to find that acceptance or how do they find that right. acceptance at church? Right. First I want to say I want to apologize for any people who've experienced to be to make feel less than and where specifically the Christian tradition, our sacred text um, has used has been used to against them, right? That's not what the Bible teaches or what we believe. Many of us believe that the Bible teaches. So I would tell you to continue to seek out communities of faith um, that welcome your complete and whole person, right? Um, in the Lutheran Church, we, our designation is reconciling in Christ, and those are churches that have done the work to be specifically welcoming to um, queer people and have done the work and continue to engage in that work. And I would tell you to continue to seek out, because they exist, communities of faith that are, are ready and willing to welcome you and your families um, into their community. Now for some uh, words of wisdom mm -hmm. from you. A lot of people are proud because yeah. it is Pride Month, but there are people out there who are still struggling, mm -hmm. uh, still turned away from their families mm -hmm. because they haven't come out or they have and mm -hmm. they haven't been accepted. So what's your advice? So my advice would be, my word of wisdom is to engage. I think 
communities, um, systems of oppressions want to keep us separate, don't want us talking to each other, don't want us dialoguing. Um, I think we need to in continue to engage in communication and, and talking with each other and seeing each other's um, humanity. I would think for communities of faith, we have to engage when we see that um, people are using our traditions, our texts, to make people to dehumanize, as opposed to challenging people to be the best versions of themselves, I think we need to speak up against that. Be that around the coffee pot after church, um, on social media, or even at our own dinner tables. And then for my baby queers, people who are just sort of beginning to understand who they are and put language to their lived experience, to know that they are a beloved child of God and that we are so lucky to have them with us and being on this planet and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith and false teachers would rise up as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last days Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3.14-22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. 
Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then for my baby queers, people who are just sort of beginning to understand who they are and put language to their lived experience, to know that they are a beloved child of God, to know that they are a beloved child of God. What does it mean to be a child of God? 1 John 3.10 explains what it means to be a child of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. The life of a child of God will be completely different from the life of the unsaved. A child of God has a desire to live in a way that pleases the Heavenly Father as we read in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Many people wrongly believe that everyone is a child of God. The Bible teaches us this is not true. We can only become his children when we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, as we read in John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 describes what happens when we are born again into the family of God through faith in Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus taught that becoming children of God means we must experience a new birth, as we read in John 3.3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A child of God is no longer a child of the devil, and God sets about transforming his children through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we read in Romans 8, 13, and 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. If we do not begin to look like our Heavenly Father in word, desire, and action, we are most likely not really His, as we read in 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. Human beings were created to live as children of God. Sin marred that purpose and broke that bond with Him. Christ restores us to that original relationship. For all eternity, the sons and daughters of God will worship Him as one united family, as we read in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. A child of God lives for him on earth and eagerly awaits a future with him in heaven, as we read in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. South Korea's military has resumed loudspeaker broadcasts directed at its neighbor in the north. 
The broadcasts are being used as psychological warfare and Blair propaganda critical of Pyongyang across the heavily militarized border. They include news and catchy South Korean pop songs. This is the latest tit-for-tat move as tensions rise between the two rivals. We want to make it clear that North Korea will be responsible of any tensions escalated between the South and North. Our government will maintain a firm and thorough readiness against any provocation from the North. That's prompted an angry warning from Kim Yo-jong, the powerful sister of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. She's called the move a prelude to a dangerous situation and says unless Seoul stops the broadcasts, the South Korean people will undoubtedly witness a new counteraction. According to Pyongyang, the latest escalation started when South Korean activists and defectors from the North sent balloons carrying messages criticizing Kim's family and regime, dollar bills, and USB sticks containing South Korean music and television shows. The North retaliated by sending hundreds of balloons carrying waste paper, cigarette butts, and animal manure across the border. Seoul described the move as an attempt to cause disruption and anxiety and suspended a 2018 military pact between the two countries that had halted military exercises and propaganda campaigns. The neighbors remained technically at war after their conflict in the early 1950s ended in an armistice but no peace treaty. At maximum output, sound from the South Korean loudspeakers can reach more than 20 kilometers into the north, far enough to potentially demoralize soldiers and civilians who hear them. It seems the latest spat is not about to end, as North Korean forces are reported to be setting up their own loudspeakers in response. Ukrainian forces on Sunday said they hit an ultra-modern Russian warplane stationed in an airbase nearly 600 kilometers from the front lines. An attack that potentially marks Ukraine's first known successful strike on an Su-57 fighter plane. The claims come after Western allies allowed Kyiv to use their weapons for limited strikes inside Russia. Kyiv's main military intelligence service shared satellite photos that showed the aftermath of the attack. Meanwhile, Ukrainian attacks have left at least 28 people dead, according to Russia installed officials in the partially occupied Ukrainian regions of Kherson and Luhansk, as Russia and Ukraine continue to exchange drone attacks overnight into Saturday. With no comment yet on the report of its Su-57 fighter being hit, Moscow claims its forces downed three Ukrainian drones in the Astrakhan region. Matthew 24, 6 and 7 And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. Final prayers on an open field. A somber mood in Sudan's Al Jazeera state. The people here prepare to lay to rest dozens of their fellow villagers. They say the dead were victims of an attack by the rapid support forces whose raids came in two waves of heavy artillery fire. An official says women, children, and the elderly were among those killed. Pictures from Wad al Nura first emerged on social media, along with these ones showing a convoy of armed fighters. The RSF confirms operating in the area, but claims it only targeted three army camps on the town's outskirts. But analysts say civilians are often caught in crossfire. In the wake of attacks on Wad al Nura, Sudan's army chief visited the survivors. While largely a welcome figure, some say the army failed to answer calls for help. Despite failing to contain the RSF, General Burhan remains defiant. We will continue this battle. We will not submit, nor will we retreat or surrender until they lay down their weapons. This battle will definitely end with the victory of the Sudanese people and the victory of the Sudanese armed forces. The UN says widespread fighting has exacerbated what it's called the world's worst internal displacement crisis. 
at least 7 million Sudanese people have fled their homes. The situation in Sudan is a catastrophe. The country is facing a hunger and malnutrition crisis. The World Food Programme is doing everything it can to scale its operation. We aim to reach up to 5 million people, but even that will not be enough. Amid calls for investigations into attacks in Al Jazeera, humanitarian agencies say shelling of residential areas, looting and systematic obstruction of access to aid is accelerating the looming threat of famine, further compounding Sudan's multiple tragedies. Aid agencies in Burkina Faso say the conflict in that part of the Sahel region is one of the most neglected. Thousands of people have been killed by armed groups affiliated to Al-Qaeda and ISIL. Government forces are struggling to contain the violence, which has raged on for years. Nearly a million people are living rough in camps scattered mostly in the northeast of the country. Many are trapped in towns which are unsafe. Hawa Mama recently arrived at this camp in Dori. Since we arrived, we haven't left. It's too dangerous to return home. Life in the camps is too dangerous. Life in the camp is hard, but we have no choice but just to survive. Aid workers are trying to reach those who are still in the villages. They have limited food, water and health care services. Fighters roam through their villages at will. They say they live in constant danger. More than 200 kilometers away from Dori, people in the capital, Wagadugu, say life may not be as dangerous in comparison but they are also struggling to make ends meet. We used to be able to go to the market with $2, but now that money is not nearly enough. For example, if you have a family of five, everything is now double. Life has become very expensive. Burkina Faso has been under a military government after the junta staged a coup in 2022. The leader, Ibrahim Traore, said his priority is to deal with the security situation, the economy, and return the country back to civilian leadership. But many people doubt their situation will change. Jihadist rebels are suspected to have killed more than 80 people in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo in less than a week. That's after an army spokesman in Congo's North Kivu province said the death toll from an attack on Friday had risen to 41. Lieutenant Colonel Mac Hazuke said the Allied Democratic Forces were responsible for the deaths in the villages of Masala, Mapasana and Mahini. In Israel, a rescue and a resignation. Israelis are rejoicing after a weekend raid freed four hostages in Gaza. At the same time, the nation's government is trying to stay together. Benny Gantz, a member of Israel's war cabinet, announced his resignation. He criticized Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and called for new elections. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. As Israelis celebrate the daring rescue of four hostages held in Gaza, Benjamin Netanyahu's government faces new challenges. One day after the raid, Benny Gantz, a member of Israel's war cabinet, announced his resignation. He called for the government to accept the Biden peace plan and for new elections. In order to ensure a real victory, it is fitting that in the fall of the year of the disaster, we go to elections which will result in the establishment of a government that will win faith and overcome the challenges. Hosting on X, Netanyahu asked Gantz to stay. This is the time for unity and not division. We must remain united within ourselves in the face of the great tasks before us. I call on Benny Gantz. Do not leave the emergency government. Don't give up on unity. Many believe elections are dangerous with Israel fighting a multi-front war. Alex Trayman tells CBN News, despite Gantz's departure, Netanyahu's 64C coalition is secure, and Israelis want unity as they face multiple enemies. Israelis are fighting uh, in Gaza, left and right, alongside each other, supporters of the prime minister, opponents of the prime minister, and they would have hoped that in this uh, time of uh, intense security crisis that the politicians would do the same. Meanwhile, Israelis are relishing the joy of Saturday's rescue. In an operation months in the planning, IDF Special Forces Saturday rescued four hostages kidnapped by Hamas on October 7th. The family reunions brought a joy and glimmer of hope 
Israelis rarely experienced in the past eight months. Netanyahu met with the freed hostages and their families, some calling it the biggest rescue in Israel's history since the Entebbe raid in 1976. Hamas claims more than 270 civilians died in the raid, but Israel says the number is less than 100. As the special forces brought the hostages to freedom, they sent the message, the diamonds are on their way home. Daniel 9, 26 and 27. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6-2. Immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world, we see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6-3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years, the culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not-too-distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however, will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. All those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will not be here to see the terrible time to come wherein God's judgment will fall upon a world that has forgotten Him. Where will we be? In the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord as a result of the rapture of the church. And there will be no announcement as to when that will take place whatsoever prior to it occurring. And if you find yourself here after it occurs, your future is going to be horrific. The stage is being set for Daniel's prophecy concerning the arrival of the Antichrist, which will be preceded by the rapture of the church. The only conclusion one can draw from all this is this. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Consider this a heads up if you're a Christian and be forewarned if you're a non-believer. If you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's time to get to know Him, and the sooner the better. Stay tuned as we continue to watch Bible prophecy unfold right before our very eyes. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation 
does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.